Okay, we're good to go? Cool. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, so tonight's talk actually came out of one of those um, innocent little questions I got the end of a, of a planetarium show. Um, the two most interesting questions normally is, uh, can you explain the Big Bang? And that's in the last 60 seconds of um, things, and it sounds like Richard's going to be doing that next, next uh, week or next month in an hour. Um, and the other one is um, the concept of time because we've all grown up starting our lives with the idea of tomorrow and now and yesterday and all that sort of stuff, um, learning to read the clock, and growing up with an absolute certainty that time just marches on, click after click after click, a uh, bit like my projector screen is doing today. Um, maybe we just turn that off till we need it, Steve. It's just being a spastic there. Um, and um, that you know, time is something that we can depend upon. And to uh, t sort of, t from all of human history, we have been able to depend on it as being an absolute rigid thing. Um, in fact, Galileo, um, in the absence of uh, really good mechanical clocks and all that, he made his early physics discoveries just by counting the pulses in his own body. Um, of course, I don't know what happened to his results when he got excited about some of the insights that he was getting. Um, but um, he, he made some brilliant insights with nothing more than the regular pulse of his heartbeat that he was measuring uh, himself. So time is something that we take for granted. Uh, but of course, Albert Einstein, um, he, gets, he sort of comes along in the early 1900s and he starts thinking about the concept of relativity. Now, uh, he wasn't the first person to do that. It's been talked about for many years beforehand. Um, but he thinks of it in the context of a light clock, um, which is quite simply, if you imagine a mirror down here and a mirror up on the ceiling, and you're bouncing a photon and a light up and down. And when you're stationary, that goes up and down. And he's imagining that makes the trip in one second. Then he imagines how that looks when the person looking at the light clock is actually sitting on the train going at a pretty hectic speed in that direction, and he comes to a realisation that uh, the observer who's standing still compared to the observer sitting on the train, there's something different. They can't both be having the same amount of time, but they all agree on the same outcome. They all agree that the photon of light, by the time the train gets over here, comes down here again. So, to get into the nuts and bolts of that, what I'm going to do is we're going to wind the clock right back to prehistoric man. Um, another way of doing it is to imagine that you're an extraterrestrial who's landed in our solar system and landed on Earth for the first time. So both of those people, brand new to the, the world of, of planet Earth and what goes on here, what's the first thing that gives you a hint that time even exists? Sun, the motion of the sun. All right, it's something that you can see very quickly. Um, the more narrow the stick is, the quicker you will see it. That you plant the stick, and you can come back even one minute later, and you see that the shadow has moved. So you've got the sense of motion, and over the course of the day, that motion seems pretty regular, and if you pardon the pun, like clockwork. And of course, the sun then goes down. You see the stars at night time, then the sun will come up again. So as um, scientists and astronomers, we've made the first observation that you know, we've landed on this planet. There seems to be this very steady progression of the sun going through. We'll call that time. Then it comes up again the next day. It happens at the exact same pace. We've now got two bits of data. We now make a prediction that it'll happen again, and it happens exactly the way we plan and predict for the third time, and then the fourth and the fifth, and lo and behold, we've defined what a day is. We get to the point where we put a stick in the ground, and we say when the shadow is pointing down that way, the sun has made one full cycle. That's what we call a day. Now, that simple concept pretty much ruled the timekeeping of planet Earth 
until the late 1700s, early 1800s. All right? It was no more complicated than that because every port that a ship would come into, they had to set their, their ship clocks uh, and all that by the local time ball. And you will see um, wherever there's a port, there's normally a time ball um, somewhere visible to all the ships that are in the port, and that would normally drop at local noon. And that was a way of the onboard clocks for the captains and the navigators to reset to know that they're leaving that port and they know exactly what latitude and longitude they're at, um, and to reset their clocks, which were highly inaccurate, so that in the hope when they're traveling across the seas, they could keep reasonable track of what their latitudes and longitudes were just by the passage of the sun and the angles that it makes. So a day's not too hard to, to work out. So now you've been sitting on planet Earth, um, observing the night sky, dutifully noting down uh, the passage of the days. What's the next sort of most obvious progression of time that you can observe? The moon. So we don't know if there is life out there anywhere else, but we believe our moon has been instrumental in allowing life to evolve on planet Earth. If that is a universal requirement to have a nice stable uh, tilt of a, of a planet and a steady rotation and all that sort of stuff, then maybe all other places where uh, highly evolved life has, has originated may also have a visible moon in the sky. Now, our moon takes a period of time to go around the Earth and get back to the same point in the sky again. It turns out that the number is about 27 days, 8 hours. Um, so if it takes 27 days, 8 hours for the moon to go all the way around the Earth once to get back to the same point in time, we've divided our calendar into a number of months, but we've got varying number of days in them. So how long is it bef between full moons in the sky? 29 and a half. Okay? So that's where the rough number of 30 comes into it. Um, so we'll get to the other number uh, shortly, but <coughs> the moon takes 27, 27 days and 8 hours to go around the Earth once completely, and yet it takes us 29 and a half days to see full moons. Marilyn? Any idea why? Because the Earth is rotating around the sun as well. Yeah, the Earth is orbiting around the sun. Yeah. So um, if I look at that projector bulb, and I'm sitting over here, the shadow is cast in a certain line. All right. After 27 days, the Earth has moved a percentage around its orbit. So to get a full moon alignment again, I've now got a different angle to reach. And so the moon needs to go that little bit further, which turns out to be about a day and a half, almost two days, uh, more than the full type of orbit to go around. And lo and behold, to observe full moons, which is what a primitive man would have been done, doing, they would have determined that you know, a month is around 29 and a bit days long. So it gets us about 30 days. So now we've got days, we've got months. Uh, those are things that everybody who is living on the planet can experience and understand. How do we determine years? The seasons? Are the seasons accurate enough that you could pinpoint? The stars. The stars. So the moon's relatively close. The stars are in the background. The seasons give us a hint in terms of where we are in that cycle around. Um, but the stars themselves, if we look at the, say, the midnight position of the sky, we will notice that after 365.2524 days, the stars come back to that exact same point again. So this is where the annual cycle comes into it, the yearly cycle. So, so far, we've got our days, our months, and our years. 
If I ask you what the time is, what are you going to tell me? <laughs> Hours and minutes, all right? Um, so you might say, if I look at the clock up there, it's quarter past eight, okay? But if I want to know what the time really is, I want to know a little bit more information. It's quarter past eight. Well, that happens twice a day. All right, so let's say it's 2015, to be accurate in terms of where it is in the day. That happens 365, 366 days a year. Um, so when you talk um, from a physics or a science point of view about what is the time, you need to locate precisely which uh, time you're, you're talking about to make it distinguished from any other time in the continuum that we've had pretty much since um, the Earth began. There's one other factor, and this is what uh, Einstein got to when he got into his general relativity, is he, le he realized that time and space itself were intertwined. They were related to each other, and one affects the other uh, and vice versa. So technically, when you're asking what the time is, you should also be specifying at what point you are asking that question. In a very simplistic way, um, we have it in our sort of day-to-day -day thing. We say it's quarter past eight. It's quarter past eight at New Zealand Standard Time. All right. In Sydney, it's two hours um, earlier, so it's quarter past six over there. The rest of the world at Meridian uh, Greenwich Mean Time, it's um, was it quarter past eight in the morning, something like that. So location is also important when you're communicating what the time is. And certainly from a scientific point of view, when we're doing uh, astronomical observations, we tend not to use the Earth as our time reference, we tend to use the Sun. All right, the sidereal time. Um, and the reason for that, of course, is the Earth's path around the Sun is not a perfect circle, it's a bit elliptical, so um, you want to have something that's a little bit more stable for you to make those uh, observations on. So most uh, star catalogues will have a precision of a star based on sidereal time that is then worked back to calculate what it is for the, an observer sitting in Auckland on a given day, given where the Earth is going to be, its, its particular distance uh, from the Sun and so forth. However, let's go down in the other direction. One of the things that, when I was a kid growing up, always sort of puzzled me, to put it in context, I was born in 67, so I was born into a decimal world, and I was born into an SI world, standard units. All right, so none of this are pounds and shillings nonsense, none of these are feet and yards nonsense, I was meters and seconds and kilograms. Um, however, as a result of that, I'm looking at the clock and I'm thinking, why 12? Why are there 12 hours of the, uh, morning and 12 hours of afternoon, evening? Why are there 24 hours in a day? Why are there 60 minutes in a day? And Eventually, I sort of found a few answers and hints in terms of what was going on. So the stars were mentioned beforehand. Um, best as I've been able to ascertain, the division of the night was done, uh, in terms of what we use today for hours, that was done in the sort of uh, pharaonic era of the Egyptians, so the pharaohs. And the astrologers uh, that reported to the pharaoh would look at the night sky because they had this belief that when the sun went down into the horizon, Ra being the, the name for their, their sun god, uh, it went through the underworld and battled all the demons, and if successful, it would come up and rise again the next day. Um, kind of scratched my head thinking how they could have that belief that if it's successful, when it's happened every day of your life without fail. Um, but nevertheless, that was the system. Because during the daytime, the sun was there, and you have to remember the context of, of Egypt. It wasn't environmentally too much different. It was a bit greener and lusher. But generally, it was when you're more than sort of a few kilometers away from the Nile, it rained once every few years and then only for a brief period of time. So you pretty much had clear skies all the time. And you could see the sun going through and doing its passage during the daytime. So how could you monitor the passage of the sun at nighttime 
to have confidence that it would rise again and you could start another day. Well, they soon realised that the sun moved at a certain pace and the stars moved at a certain pace as well. So they came up with this system of looking at the night sky and today we have a lot of constellations that we use to reference where things are. They had 36 individual sort of roughly evenly spaced uh, objects in the sky. Some of them we might refer to as constellations, some of them are just sort of bright stars. And they called them the hours. Uh, and on any given night, they could identify at least sort of 10 hours sitting above the horizon, and they would watch those hours tick by. So if you've heard that expression of watching the hours go by, it literally goes all the way back to the Egyptian pharaohs uh, and waiting for dawn to rise again. So there's the 10 hours that they would watch sort of tick by to make that, that happen. Now, they were at an advantage compared to what we are at the latitude here in, in Auckland. Um, I know in Whangarei we're 35. What's our latitude down here? Yeah, 36, 37. Um, so we have this god-awful thing called daylight savings um, because our days get longer, our nights get shorter. Uh, at the point uh, on the planet where, where they lived, that the extremes between a long winter's night and a long winter's day were not as, as uh, pronounced as they are at our latitudes. So that didn't really factor into their equation. Had they have been more in sort of Sicily, Italy and, and higher up, that may well have been a factor in their uh, calculations. But where they were in northern Africa, it wasn't really a problem they had to take an account of. Um, so they would watch the, 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 the hours tick by, um, ten of them in total, every night, clicking by. And because you don't go instantly from day to night, you've got dawn and dusk, there's your two hours on either side, gives you your 12 hours a night. And then just to make it consistent, they then created things like a sundial and divided it into 12 equal parts as well. So the sun now would make 12 equal um, sort of passages or, or divisions during the daytime and 12 at night. And the difference in the length of time it took between, as I say, a winter's day and a summer's day uh, was relatively minor, uh, certainly with the uh, accuracy they had of the day, that it didn't really come into their calculations uh, as a major factor. It did, however, pose a little bit of a problem. Um, it's a pretty blunt type of timekeeping thing. Even back in those days, if you say you're going to meet somebody at 3 o'clock, it's okay if they're 5 minutes late, maybe even 10 minutes late, you forgive them. But if all you've got is the hour to measure distance of the passage of time, uh, it's a little bit blunt, because if they're a whole hour late, you'd get a bit annoyed, wouldn't you? Um, so they came up and they wanted to divide it down, particularly with the likes of sundials. Um, they certainly had big stone obelisks and all sorts of things, so they could watch the passage uh, of uh, the shadow and, and get it a little bit more accurately than the one hour thing. And they decided to divide it not into 10 equal parts, which might have been the logical thing, uh, because of course it's easy to count to 10, um, they divide it into 60. Okay, we call them minutes. But why 60? Okay. Cutting circles. Yep. It's the most divisible number. Um, <coughs> there's just a few, like, it's not divisible by 7 and 9 and that sort of stuff. But pretty much from 1 to 10, it's almost easily divisible. Um, it's also very easy to count on your hand to 60. In fact, it's easy to count to 144 on your hands, but um, they, they did it to 60. So how do you count to 60? The joints. Yeah. Joints. So, all right. So you've got 12 joints on those four fingers. And you indicate which joint, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six, there, all the way up to 12. All right? 
And then with the other hand, there's the first 12, second 12, third 12, fourth, fifth 12. So you see, if you pointed with both uh, type of things, you could get to 144, but why would you not point with both hands? You have to... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't actually know. Um, my suspicion is um, there's no ambiguity about what that means. All right, because one is pointing how many twelfths there are and the other one's pointing to which of the twelfths. Whereas if you've got two hands, it's like, oh, is that the low, the first digit or is this the first one? Um, so, you know, if you're indicating to somebody behind you, that sort of stuff. So I think it's an ambiguity thing that might have made that a more practical thing. Uh, so, yeah, counting to 60 is quite good. Uh, as a side note, the remember the story, which, uh, if you've ever done maths or something like that, that the ancient civilizations accepted the imaginary number, square root of minus one, before they accepted zero? Anyone heard that story? All right. Um, I... From what I can tell, it seems to date back to that Sumerian period. Um, and best as I can tell, they had a system where they had to point somewhere there. So they didn't have the open hand. No zeros. So if, if anybody ever finds out for real, I'd be very keen to know. But that seems to be... Sorry? Yeah. So. How do they do the square root of minus one? They didn't trust that. I don't think Sumerians did the square root of minus one, but um, that was accepted before the concept of zero for some reason. Uh, so maybe it's the Greeks that sort of got into that. I don't don't know quite who. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, you know, doing squares and squares are negatives. They kind of realised that there's an imaginary number there, but um, getting to zero. As I said, maybe they just had a philosophical objection to it, but, I mean, if you've got two and you take two away, you... <laughs> um, so, yeah, so that's how we got to the minutes, and then, of course, the seconds is just an extension of that once we started having uh, analog clocks. So that really was the timekeeping um, of the day all the way through until about the uh, 13th or 14th century. Um, at that point, we started creating mechanical clocks. They certainly had some sort of mechanical clocks prior to that. Um, the Egyptians had sand timers and water timers and that sort of stuff. But they were very short duration. They were almost like timers rather than clocks. Um, around that uh, 13th, 14th century, we started having clocks that would um, just keep ticking away for days on end. They weren't terribly accurate. Um, but what do you think that those clocks highlighted with the whole timekeeping problem. You're kind of getting that, that direction. I think you're on the right path. It's just I'm thinking of slightly differently. So remember I said that the hours between winter and summer didn't make much difference in the sort of latitudes of Egypt around the top of the tropical region. By the time you got to a place like London, for instance, which I think is about 50 degrees north or something of that nature, um, if you were employed to work a 12-hour day, which is not uncommon back then, um, in summertime, you worked a long 12 hours. All right? In winter, it was a very short one. The mechanical clock highlighted the, the, the sort of discrepancy uh, or the problem with just using the passage of the sun to count the hours down and dividing it down that way. Uh, and as mechanical clocks got more and more accurate, timekeeping had to sort of revert uh, or, or turn about face, and we ended up getting to the point where we needed to create a standard for what a second is. So how do you define a second? Uh, and the early clocks uh, struggled with all sorts of mechanical limitations to do that. I've already mentioned sort of ship's clocks. Um, around the sort of late 1700s, early um, 1800s, they started to have clocks that could keep time on ships without succumbing to um, 
the, the moisture um, and the um, sort of temperature variations, the humidity problems and all that sort of stuff that you get by having a clock physically on board a moving, rocking vessel and all that sort of stuff. I mean, grandfather clocks are really good, um, but you put that swinging pendulum on a swinging boat and it don't keep much time anymore. Um, so as we get uh, to the point of the late 1800s, we're getting to the point where we've got nice accurate clocks and the seconds are clicking off. Um, by today's standards, yes, they lose a lot of sort of seconds per day or maybe even seconds per week if it's very accurate. Uh, but it means we have a very good way of keeping track of time. It's around the mid-1800s we started to create these things called time zones. And that was brought around by the fact that now we had transportation technology that would go over rail, whereas previously pretty much all uh, transportation was done by sea. Now at sea, you don't have a problem if there's a vessel coming your way. There's rules of uh, the sea that they navigate and pass each other without colliding. When you've got one rail between London and Birmingham, and that one leaves when the time ball says it's midday in Birmingham, and that one leaves when the time ball says it's in London, and those time balls are working on local midday type of time periods, the schedule is such that those trains would collide on the tracks. So they ended up creating a standard time zone, uh, and that's pretty much what we've now inherited, is that the world is divided, there's, there's some half hour time zones, uh, but generally into 24 time zones uh, around the world and it's just political and geographic boundaries that define which one you fall into half the time. So we've now got to a point where we've got time being clicked off on a second by second basis. Then along comes Einstein with his thought experiment. And if you think back to that light clock I mentioned in the very beginning. So if I stand here perfectly stationary, we would both observe the light photon lifting up from my hand, bouncing onto the ceiling, and dropping back down a second later. But if I move at a steady pace, and I ignore everything that's out there, I still observe the light going straight up and straight down. In other words, it's literally just doing the same as if I was standing still, but you've observed it going at an angle as I've moved across at a steady pace and coming back down. So according to the laws of Pythagoras, you've observed the long path, uh, whereas I've observed, uh, observed the, uh, the adjacent side, the, um, the shorter path there. Yet we got a little bit of a problem because we both agree when it lands back in my hand. And we both, because of the speed of light, that's the special nature of the light clock, we both have observed that photon of light traveling at the speed of light. Even though, as you've seen it, I've added some extra velocity to it, you would think that I might um, have made that light move at V plus C, but you observe it at speed C, I observe it at speed C. Now, if I advance through, let's see if uh, we get any luck on this, Steve. Fingers crossed my laptop uh, behaves. You'll see the diagram, and uh, this is the only equation I'll throw up. Um, and so there's the two different paths. A is the way I see it, whether I'm stationary or moving. And when I'm moving, B is the way you see it. And given that the light is always traveling at speed C, the only thing that can really bend and, and, and meld in this equation is what the observed time is um, for, for the photon versus uh, for the observer. And when you do, and it's just um, uh, Pythagoras' theorem that's involved, you end up with that equation that says, you guys sitting uh, observe T prime, uh, which is a fraction of the time uh, observed up there. Um, now, this is the graph that indicates how much uh, the time is uh, sort of different for different observers. Uh, and the key thing here is that uh, it's a velocity of 
the fraction of speed of light. We can't go any faster than the speed of light, so that's um, basically an asymptote up there. Uh, however, what you notice is that when you're down in this range, the two lines are just indistinguishable. It's not until you start getting up to about 40% of the speed of light that the line lifts up any. Now, I did some basic calculations just to give you a sense of why this is something that is counterintuitive. Because sitting here on planet Earth, we travel around the Earth at quite some considerable speeds at times, uh, especially on the motorways. Um, but compared to the speed of light, we're standing still. Um, at 100 kilometers an hour, how much time dilation do you think goes on? How many decimal points would I need um, to express that fraction? 10? Very conservative estimate. It's about 15 decimal places. So if you could measure time to the accuracy of 15 decimal places, you would be able to measure time dilation in a vehicle moving at 100 kilometers an hour. Um, the people on the International Space Station, they're moving at about 27 and half thousand kilometers an hour. I worked out you need 10 decimal places for them to experience uh, or, or to compare the time dilation between the two. Now, surprisingly, that is starting to become a significant factor because our entire GPS systems are based on satellites orbiting around and sharing relative precisional information and triangulating so that they can tell you when you're, you know, if your phone tells you when you're at a specific latitude, it's because those satellites have triangulated it and all that sort of stuff. They need to take this equation into account, even though at the speeds they're moving, they need nine to 10 decimal places to work out what the time dilation is. All right. If they didn't factor that in, their positioning could be out on planet Earth, and I think from memory, they could be out somewhere between 50 to 100 meters. Um, so it's quite a significant uh, factor uh, that they could do. Um, the, you might remember, I um, can't remember, was it Mark or Scott Kelly was the guy who was uh, on board the space station for a year. It was Scott on for, for a whole year. Um, well, he's the twin brother, um, and because they're identical twins, they are exactly the same age, if you go back to point of conception, for instance, all right? Um, as a result of Scott spending a whole year on the International Space Station, I think I saw a figure somewhere, he is now a millisecond older than his brother. <laughs> um, so even at the speeds that we have going around planet Earth and all that sort of stuff, uh, these things are hard to sort of um, get an intuitive feel for. Um, but where does it come into it? How does it uh, really, as astronomers, affect us? When I first went to university, um, I remember there was a, a big debate and a revelation about what was going on with neutrinos coming from the sun. Now, neutrinos decay, and we've learned that there's three different flavors of neutrinos, and they sort of morph into each other. And there was a real problem that what the theory was telling them um, in terms of the, the relative proportions of the three different flavors that they should be observing, what they were actually observing, there was a disconnect there. And they had to put this into the equation because the neutrinos were traveling at almost the speed of light. And they were experiencing time far, far slower than we sort of expected without taking relativity into the equation. And that was, once they put that into the equation, um, with the decay rates that they knew for the neutrinos, it matched up perfectly with the observation. And, you know, the world was nice and structured again. Everything was explained. Um, but it is a difficult one, completely counterintuitive to wrap your nut around. And I remember hearing a presentation that, uh, or, or hearing of a presentation that Einstein did one day, and he was sort of musing in his presentation about he hasn't got the outcome that he wanted from that. And some sort of undergraduate student at the back um, sort of 
put his hand up and said, Professor Einstein, you haven't taken relativity into account. <laughs> At which point Einstein sort of looked up, shut his book and walked out. <laughs> So even the master got caught out by it uh, when you need to take it into account and when you don't need to take it into account. Um, okay, so the upshot of that is that as human beings, we've got a very steady click, click, click pro progression of time. However, when there's motion between two bodies, time is observed at going at different paces. And it has the, the impact uh, from a real world type of point of view. Um, so how do we measure time? Well, today, we no longer use the motion of the Earth to de determine time. One reason for that, it might have done us uh, pretty well for thousands of years as we built our earlier civilizations, uh, but now in a sort of highly precision environment that we live in now, we need a better way of determining the second that is not based on the rotation of the Earth. Uh, that is not based on the orbit of the Earth. In fact, that is not based on the solar system as a whole. And one of the most reliable methods that's been used for the last couple of decades uh, is basically a cesium fountain. Um, so that cylinder tube in there has evacuated uh, cesium in it. And that cesium oscillates from the ground state at some, you can see the number up there, some 9 billion odd times per second. Um, I don't know how they managed to count this and how they came up with that specific number, but that's what has been agreed upon as the number of oscillations per second. And they've created some 400 of these clocks and they spread them around the world in about 70 different locations. And they take the results from all those 400 clocks to come up with an averaged time that we use to record uh, our, our passage of time. Uh, these days. So that's the international sort of uh, atomic time or, or TIA uh, that is used um, for having a precise progression of time as it goes through. However, they can do better. The accuracy of a clock like this is that it would lose around about three seconds every thousand odd years. Now, that's better than a mechanical clock for sure. Um, but there are some people who are just not happy with that level of imprecision. And so um, they've been hunting for a more accurate clock. And Einstein himself actually kind of gave us a little bit of a hint that there might be a better way of figuring it out. When he, after having worked out his special relativity, he sort of started from the, the basics again and started working out his theory of general relativity. Now, general relativity is where he made a formal mix between space, time, and the distortion that happens um, as, as you have energy or mass distribution in there. Now, in that, he said that gravity is like a constant acceleration force. And so that got some people thinking, is that if gravity is like a constant acceleration f force, when we got our feet down on the ground, that is closer to the gravitational source that's in the local area, namely planet Earth, than my head, or the top of my head, that is six foot away. Now, albeit six foot, in the overall scale of things um, of, of the size of the Earth, which is you know, six and a half thousand kilometers in diameter, or radius, um, it's a very small type of thing, but nevertheless, there is a gradient, and so the gravitational force that my feet feel should be a little bit stronger than what the tip of my head feels. And as a result, my toes should be a little bit older than the tip of my head. All right? Because they're ex experiencing acceleration, they're in a stronger gravitational field, time is going faster for them uh, than it is at the tip of my head. So, um, some bright boffins went off and created uh, what's called an optical lattice clock. So this is the closest thing to Einstein's theoretical 
uh, light clock that there is. This is a relatively good picture, although very much simplified. You can imagine the equipment is a lot more complex than what this picture shows. Um, but it's a, it's a cube of ultra-cooled atoms, uh, specifically on this um, unit or, or equipment that was um, successfully built in 2018. It's a, um, a 3D array of strontium atoms up there. And in order to make it accurate that the only thing impacting it was the oscillation of the atoms and nothing in the environment, you had to cool it down. And you can see in my slide there, they cooled it to somewhere between 10 to 50 nanokelvins. That's, that's pretty cold. Um, in fact, it's, it's, it's uh, well, Richard might, uh, I know he's got some people there that work on um, ultra-cooled physics, and that laptop is going to get retired when it gets home. <laughs> um, but they have a, a, a cube of somewhere between 10 and 100,000 atoms there. Um, so it's about 20 to 60 micrometers in size. And the oscillations that they uh, excite this cube with, with the um, precise frequency of the laser, has a precision of uh, 2.5 by 10 to the 19, which basically means that this clock can keep time that is only just 200 milliseconds in the 13.8 billion years since the Big Bang. That's how accurate this clock is. Now, the timekeeping is a nice, uh, nice um, bonus from that. What they really set out to do here was to try and find some way of exploring the realms of the quantum world um, with you know, the sort of very low, uh, low energy uh, type of atoms and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, they're still working quite significantly on that um, type of project there. But fundamentally, this clock is now able to keep a very accurate, and they've proven it, that was in 2018. They haven't replaced the... Um, uh, the, the cesium fountain clocks around the world yet, but uh, if they can make the, enough of these and make it reliable, that they might well replace that in years to come. Um, but the one they've built is in Boulder, Colorado. And it keeps time to that level of accuracy. And when I first heard about this, I was, um, well, my mind was completely blown because if they move this, two centimetres up. So if they put a phone book under the thing, they can measure the time difference. That's how sensitive uh, this is to the, um, to the Einstein's gravitational field. So things like this sort of leave you in no doubt about the whole concept of relativity and the integration of space-time and all that. Um, I just find it personally you know, fascinating that we now actually have a piece of technology that Einstein could, Einstein could dream of Head, um, and that goes beyond anything that he ever dealt uh, um, specified. But it does sort of raise a little bit of a, a question, if you like, um, for us as we go out and explore um, the universe. Let's say we set up a settlement on Mars. All right? Mars has a different strength of gravity because it's a different mass of planets. So does the moon. So Whilst everything comes from Earth, that's all fine, but by the time you've got a civilization on Mars that's a 1,000 or 2,000 years down the track, they're going to want to keep time according to the way they experience it on Mars. All right. Now, on Mars, how many moons does Mars have? How many moons can you see? None. Um, they're captured asteroids, unlike our moon. They're not visible to the unaided eye. Um, because they're only about sort of half to a few kilometers in size, I believe. Um, so, you know, they don't cast shadows at night the way our beautiful moon does um, and all that sort of stuff. So it's probably great for astronomers because you never have to worry about the moon. Um, but it probably means that if life had originated on Mars, our sense of timekeeping would be days. It probably wouldn't have months. 
We might have done something around seasons, but we certainly have years. When we go further, probes going out into um, the, the, the sort of vacuums of space out beyond our solar system now and all that sort of stuff, the speeds they're going, as I showed earlier on, the level of time difference they're observing is very small. But when we get to the point of finally, well, if we're lucky enough to actually confirm contact with a civilization somewhere else, in order to understand what's coming from it, we kind of need to understand what, what their relative motion is to us in order to sort of figure out if we're keeping the same time and what the message signals are. Uh, and if we get to the point, as some people are suggesting, that we'll send out uh, autonomous probes to other star systems that might arrive in 60 or 100,000 years' time, uh, if we get to the point of having technology where we could um, realistically do that and you know, leave it to our uh, descendants way down the track to, to receive the results, we're going to need to take into account um, the fact of the, the speeds these spacecraft have gone and how time has changed for them compared to us uh, if we're going to make sense of the data that comes back to us from, from those locations. Um, same thing when we study the physics around what's going around black holes and all that sort of stuff. The, the gravitational field around there, the speed those particles are um, moving, particularly around the event horizon, where we see you know, X-rays and gamma rays coming off because of the high energy uh, that's involved there, we need to take into account the fact that those particles are experiencing time very, very different scales to what we do here sitting on this little planet we call Earth. Uh, so to wrap it all up, I'm going to take a chance that uh, my system uh, does it. So rather than summarizing everything myself, I'm going to let Brian Cox uh, have a crack. And uh it's not going to work, is it? No. The smallest unit of time that has any sort of significance. Okay, sorry folks, this is just um, too painful. Um, what I'll do, I'll get Chris to, to send the link out to you. It's only a nine minute video, but it kind of, Brian's an excellent communicator. And if you Google him, he is talking about time so many times on YouTube. Um, there's even a very funny skit that I was hoping to play at the beginning, but I couldn't find it anymore, where an interviewer asks him, um, you know, what's time? And Brian's saying, well, nobody really knows what time it is. And the interviewer's saying, of course, it's 7.30. And Brian's saying, we don't really know how time works. And the interviewer's like, yes, we do. It's 7 flippin' 30. <laughs> Um, so if you see that one, that's, that's worth uh, having a look at as well. Um, he did mention Planck time there, and I've got a little bit of, of, of time free. Does anybody want to get, or, or actually I'll put it to you guys, anybody got an explanation for what Planck time is? As I understand it, it's the quantization of the smallest chunk of time in there, is that right? That's often the interpretation given to it. Um, so, but yeah, I've been sort of pondering it and I've come up with slightly different tact on it. Um, but it's often thought of as the smallest possible time there is. Anyone else? Okay. If you look at um, a waveform and you take um, periodic measurements, you might see uh, sort of points all over the, the, the spectrum there, and you might come to the conclusion that there's a wave going around at a certain time, a certain frequency. Now, there's a concept of sampling theory that you have to sample at twice um, the, the highest frequency uh, in order to be able to see it. Because if you imagine, if I take a sample here, 
and I take a sample over here, if I've got a long, steady wavelength and so forth, I might get an idea what that is. But if there's a whole bunch of noisiness inside here, that's completely obscured to me when I take measurements that are too far apart. It's a sampling theory type of thing. Now, Planck time is, as was said, the smallest quantity of time, but it's not necessarily uh, believed to be the smallest unit of time there is. It's the smallest that we can understand. And it turns out to be 10 to the minus 43 seconds. And the way it came about is that uh, the laws of physics are governed by three fundamental concepts, uh, constants. There's a gravitational concept, um, constant, uh, which is big G. Um, there's H, which um, Planck's constant, uh, which governs quantum mechanics. And there's C, the speed of light. And by equating those around, you end up being able to calculate what's called the Planck length, which is 10 to the minus 34 meters. And when you multiply that to, or divide it by the speed of light, you come to a Planck time, which is 10 to the minus 43 seconds. So quite simply, the way I look at Planck time, it's simply stating we understand the world through these three constants of physics, the gravitational constants, the speed of light, and Planck's constant for quantum physics. Um, that is the resolution that we can measure the world at. And as a result of those three, the smallest distance we can get is the Planck uh, length, which is 10 to the minus 34 meters, and that gives us the Planck time. What, when people say our physics breaks down when we get down to those scales, what they're saying is that with those three constants, we don't have the resolution to go any deeper and find out what's happening inside there. And there's some people who are thinking that because the world of quantum mechanics and the world of uh, sort of ordinary um, classical physics and uh, electrostatics and all that sort of stuff are kind of like at loggerheads and in some cases coming up with very different results, that there might be something more in information that we don't yet know and with the constants that we have that we can't drill into and find out. So that's quite simply where the Planck time comes from. Um, whether or not that means that, that time itself is a quantized quantity is yet to be conclusively proven. I know there are some teams who believe they've got evidence for it, um, and I know there are other people who are saying that quite simply, well, it's just a resolution thing. You know, If we had better tools, we could maybe get down to 10 to the minus 50 or 10 to the minus 60 or even beyond that. Um, so, yeah, the quantization of it is, is a little bit of an unknown. Uh, so that's where Planck time comes from. All right, questions? Um, Peter, you haven't mentioned the theory that time is related to entropy, and particularly with macroscopic objects, mm -hmm. where you really experience the one-way entropy, and you don't see that the sometimes particle so much. Um, yeah. That seems difficult to me to relate to Einstein's um, space-time continuum. How, how would entropy fit into the space-time continuum? How entropy fits in is a really... Um, I, I don't know um, how to easily e explain that. Um, I mean, entropy is basically a measure of the amount of chaos or disorganization there is in a system. Um, over the, the lockdown, I watched a video that I think uh, might go a little bit towards it in terms of explaining the arrow of time. Um, because you know, one of the things about time, it seems to only go in one direction. All right? um, with all this stuff from Einstein and general and special relativity, we can make time go faster and slower um, but we can't reverse time. In theory, the mathematics is reversible. In, pra in practice, the physics, we've never been able to stop a system and move it backwards, and that's the entropy thing. And what he was uh, demonstrating it by is, say, you've got 10 marbles, uh, oh, sorry, 10 coins, and you align them um, in the bottom of a jar so they're all face up. That is a system that has very low entro entropy, 
because there is only one way that you can arrange those coins so that they all face up. All right? If you flip one of them, the entropy now is 10 times higher because how do you get nine down and one up? Well, it could be any one of the 10 that do that. So do that for two coins. You've now got about 90 different ways of organizing that system. So if you shake it, statistically, you're going to have half down, half up. All right? That's the highest level of entropy. And it's like time is doing that. Every system is constantly in motion. Nothing's ever permanently at rest. And so um, every system is moving to a state of higher entropy uh, and all that sort of stuff. So unless something external, like a human being, uh, comes along and creates a local point of low entropy, which might be arranging the coins, it might be building a skyscraper or something like that. These things don't happen naturally in nature. They need some outside influence to do that. In terms of how that relates to a quantum type of thing, I have not heard of any sort of uh, link from it, and I suspect that that is also in the realm of trying to cross between the classical and the quantum boundaries and bring those two theories together. Um, so, yeah, there's somebody probably getting a PhD or maybe even a Nobel Prize out of it one day. So. Yeah? Just a kind of question going back to the fun time thing. Um, so you said it was kind of made up of those three different constants. Yeah. However, two of those constants have been kind of fixed in recent years. Mm -hmm. So I know they, they fixed Planck's constant, I think it was the last year or the, something with the, the Kibble balance, and then a while before that they fixed the speed of light. But then we all know that the gravitational constant's only known to about like 10 to the negative 11. Um, and it's because of the weakness of the gravitational force, I don't know how, yeah. how you could kind of improve on the measurement. So I, I suppose what would be the way to improve on that? Time, yeah, well, you know, when you're saying uh, fixed, um, what we're referring to is they've sort of got to a point where with the equipment they've got, they can measure it to a certain level of precision, and then it's just like the distance between the Earth and the Sun. They've said that one astronomical unit, that's the length we're going to define it at. And the same thing with the Planck's constant um, and the speed of light and all that sort of stuff. So they've, they've kind of made a call based on the precision we've got, what that number should be that everybody uses for their stuff. The number itself, to some degree, they could have fixed it anywhere in that, that, that sort of range because it's an arbitrary type of thing. Um, if you think about it, if we do ever make contact with another advanced species somewhere else, they won't measure time in seconds. They won't measure distance in meters. They will have their own units, which is based on the environment in which they evolved and, and, and developed their scientific basis and knowledge. So we'll need to have some sort of common reference point. But the physics tells us that they too will have come to an understanding of the natural units, which is you know the Planck time, the Planck length, and that sort of stuff. Those are what we think the most fundamental things that is achievable to be measured uh, or, or theoretically reckoned. So it may well be that when we do have, you know, alien communications and all that sort of stuff in millennia to come, that that will be the, the common basis. And we'll just sort of have a translation for earthlings and a translation for Vulcans and a translation for everybody else. So, um, but yeah, the, the fixing of the number, I wouldn't worry too much. And, you know, the fact they're working at, you know, 10 to, to 15 decimal places to try and lock down the number just for the sake of simplicity is making a small difference. It's still in the order of 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Yeah, Norman. How do you measure the accuracy of a really accurate clock? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you saw that number I had up on the slide beforehand. Um, you know, I mean, to be accurate to 19 decimal places, you know, there's that many oscillations per second. Um, I, honest, 
I mean, I even struggle with the um, with the cesium fountain, how they how they measure nine billion something oscillations per second. Um, yeah, from the little that I've done in terms of um, reading up on the apparatus, they excite it with a certain precise frequency of laser, and I think therein might lie the secret of how they do that. But that answer you'd probably need to track somebody down who works and builds these things. Um, they hopefully would know the answer. Um, because the thing itself seems a completely arbitrary thing. It is. And then you just try to create a device that... Counts nine and a half yeah, billion of them, or trillions, or what? Yeah. Calculates an arbitrary number. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, as I say, the engineering of a of a thing like that is uh, not something that I've looked into in any great thing. But uh, let's just say very accurately. <laughs> so, all right. Anyone else? Yes. So if you measure the constants to a higher precision, would the Planck length then shrink? Um, <laughs> you'd you'd home in on it, but. You know, we're talking about Planck length being of the order of 10 to the minus 43. Um, so I don't know what the exact number is. Let's say it's 4.3. If we get a little bit more precision, it might go to 4.25. Still, the order is 10 to the minus 43. So we're quite comfortable we've got the order of magnitude pinned down. It's just, you know, is it 4 or 4.2, whatever the number is. No, it could be infinitely precise. <laughs> yeah, you might be 4.2136789 or something like that. Uh, and there are one or two constants that they have been able to experimentally measure, and I can't remember what it is, but it's a fascinating achievement that physicists also always sort of uh, quote when they go for funding. It's like, see, we can do it. Um, I can't remember, is it the electric force or something like that? And they've got it to 10 or 12 decimal places. And they've got it to that accuracy in the uh, in the theory and in the experiment. Um, so you know, there's hope that some of these fundamental concepts that we will get better technology and be able to nail it down. Uh, but what people are really hoping is that the more precisely we try and measure it, and that's what the guys who created this optical lattice clock are really trying to work through, is that we might discover some new properties of the quantum world that help us understand it better and what's going on in that area. Because as much as we now accept quantization, nobody understands why. Why should the world be quantized in little energy packets? Um, that is something that, you know, string theory is trying to explain it in one direction. There's other theories going in other directions. They've all got equally valid arguments for um, but they've all got points of contention that is working against them. So um, this is very much a jury's out. And um, you know, as I said, there's a Nobel Prize waiting for somebody if they can figure it out. Yeah. Uh, is time a fourth dimension, and why? Yes, um, absolutely. Uh, when we talk about space-time, we're talking about the three spatial directions, and time is a fourth dimension. So um, there is something um, called the invariant interval. Uh, and it's a feature of special relativity in particular uh, when you study it. And it basically says that everything is always moving at the speed of light. I'm paraphrasing it and simplifying it really quite simply. Um, so if you imagine an arrow um, from the floor going up here uh, being time, and if we talk about a one-dimensional space uh, going across horizontally here, all right. When I start the presentation, I'm here. This is my here and now point. All right. I have not moved out of this room, so I haven't moved this way, but I've moved forward in time. So my here and now has moved at the speed of light through time, not through space. The invariant interval basically says if I moved at the speed of light that way, time would slow down to me to the point where if I could actually get to the speed of light, time would stop. So quite literally, if I was moving at the speed of light, I would not experience any movement in time, and I'd be able to get all the way over there at the speed of light at the precise time that I left. Now, mass is not able to be accelerated. There's some physical boundary, and we don't quite 
have all the sort of conditions and bounds uh, how and why that is. But as a result, there's something that's called a light cone that sort of comes out from the here and now point, which defines the area of space time that I'm allowed to move into. Because I can't move that way faster than the speed of light. Um, so if I move over that direction, I end up going sort of on the edge of that um, cone that comes out there. If I'm going less, I've got a cone with a much, much higher uh, angle in there. So I'm sort of constrained in where I can move in space-time. So they're very much interconnected in that way. What's leading people down the string theory point of view is if they add another dimension, the fifth dimension, they end up being able to tease out of those equations, and they all come out of Einstein's equations for general relativity, his field equation. If you put it in the five dimensions, you can tease out of that the laws. Um, um, what's the electromechanical guy? Um, no, Maxwell. not there. Yeah. Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism. They fall out of a five-dimensional space time with the fifth dimensional basically representing something that's sort of folded in that represents the electric force. And that got string theorists sort of thinking around it. And then, you know, most string theories that are being advanced are looking at 11 dimensional. Um, there's some that are looking at 26 dimensional. Um, needless to say, I haven't got a handle on 11 dimensions, let alone 26. But given that we can do it with four and five, we can't dismiss that as being a harebrained idea, and certainly some of the predictions coming out to it are standing up, but the thing is, it's opening as many questions as it is answering. So it's not a complete theory, uh, and nobody's saying that it's the be all and end all. But yeah, Brian Cox is a, a string theorist, and so is um, his US counterpart, Brian Green, Brian Green thank you. Um, so yeah, all right. Cool. Just, um, just one thing before you finish it, reminded me talking about clocks that um, they've got a CDM fountain clock at, up at Wolfgang at the radio. Oh, uh, right. The laboratory there, they use for a very long baseline interferometry. Okay. They have telescopes in Australia, New Zealand, some in the Northern Hemisphere, they're all observing the same signal. And they, to do VLBI, where they combine them onto one telescope, they need really accurate timing. So they store the data and they inject time signals into it so mm. they can correlate the data with each of the radio telescopes. So they, okay. yeah, they've got a cesium fountain clock up there to do that, which the reason I thought of that is we haven't been out there for quite a long time, so <laughs> no, <laughs> I'll ask them if we can organise the society visit. Yeah, must That'd remember that next time I drive back and check my clock. <laughs> <laughs> So, Peter, I'd like to, on behalf of us all, thank you very, very much for a, a brilliant talk. I'm <laughs> <laughs>